everybody and welcome to the Taste Canada Awards Culinary Writing Workshop. I'm Sabrina Fallone, Event Director for Cooks the Books, presented by Canola Eatwell. We are all so thrilled to welcome you to this year's cooking competition. We have no doubt that your entries are going to be amazing. And to kick off the season, we wanted to work through what it takes to write a really terrific recipe. Jennifer McKenzie is going to be working through the workshop with you. Jennifer is a professional home economist and she's written nine cookbooks herself. She's also a former restaurateur and the national chair of the Taste Canada Awards Committee. So Jen is going to be talking through some of the do's and don'ts, some of the expert tips and tricks on how to write a recipe with a competitive edge. So with all that said, Jen, I'll hand it off to you. Today, I'm joined by Lynn Weaver, a registered dietitian and the promotion manager for SAS Canola and a member of the Canola Eatwell team. Canola is our sponsor of our workshop and we're so pleased to have Lynn with us to tell us a little about, about Canola. Jennifer, thanks so much for having me today. I am so happy to rep represent the 43,000 canola farmers across Canada that grow canola every year on their farms. Thanks so much. I, that's impressive. That's a, it's a wonderful Canadian ingredient, isn't it? And um, you know what? I find I, I cook with it all the time. It's my standard oil. And it's one of those things where um, you, you sort of don't think about it, but there's actually a lot to this, uh, this oil in this bottle. It is a great go-to oil because it, first of all, people don't, um, many people are unaware of the nutrition benefits, but it's very low in saturated fat. In fact, um, lower in saturated fat than both olive oil and vegetable oil. It is also, uh, has a nice source of omega-3 fat, and those are those fats that we definitely need to eat more of in our, in our diet. It's versatile. It doesn't have a flavor. You can purchase uh, canola oil that um, is cold pressed, but most anecdotal oil that you get in the grocery store has been um, filtered so that there are no flavors in it. And that's great because it really makes the ingredient shine when you're using a recipe. Because of that as well, it also has a high smoke point. So it can be used for all applications of cooking, baking, frying, deep frying. Um, really, it makes it a versatile, real workhorse in the kitchen. It really does. And I think because of its neutral flavor and the, the way the oils enhance the other flavors, um, I'm going to use it in a salad dressing and it, you know, it doesn't overpower the other ingredients, but it really brings out the flavor of the other ingredients. It is affordable. So it's grown in Canada. Um, because it's affordable, it doesn't mean that it's a lower quality ingredient. And you're right, it enhances the flavor of the other ingredients. So you don't need to use a stronger flavored oil um, to do that. You can let the ingredient shine with the use of canola oil. Exactly. So yeah, definitely, um, if you're not already using it, uh, you definitely want to explore it. We love all of our Canadian ingredients and we love to support our Canadian farmers for sure. Uh, no importing um, costs and uh, no environmental impact on the importing too. So that's uh, another bonus. It really is a wonderful Canadian ingredient um, that we um, that we should all be using in our kitchens and our restaurants and long-term care facilities and all of those other great places where um, chefs are cooking really delicious food. Super. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lynn, and uh, thanks for sponsoring our workshop. Oh, my pleasure. Today we're going through some of the basic how-tos of recipe development. And uh, it's a little different than, you know, throwing things together and, and putting your dinner together and, and you never have to make it again the exact same way. You can kind of ad lib. However, when we're doing recipe development, our main goal is to create a written document and make sure that someone else can follow those set of instructions and make the same recipe the same way you do. So. It takes a lot more precision. And one of the things that we have to consider, there's, there's several sort of key, key points, but um, once you've decided what you're developing the recipe for, that's, you know, number one. Um, number two is to decide who the audience is. So if your audience is a professional cook, or if your audience is a cook at home, or maybe a, a child or a student, you have to speak to them in the language that they're going to understand. So that's the language we want to use throughout our recipe development. 
So for professional chefs, you might want to do larger volumes, weights, and you can assume that they have a lot of basic technique. However, for a home cook or a student, you actually have to sort of coach them along a little more, be a lot more specific, and include all of the uh, the things that they might just not know because you as a, a professional have a lot more knowledge and what you have to do is pass that knowledge on to the person that's going to make your recipe. So one of the things that we uh, need to do is decide on our ingredients and our quantities. So uh, choose your recipe, figure out all the ingredients and do a sketch um, based on other recipes you've seen. You can't copy another recipe but you can you know get ideas and, and start with some basic points about how much quantities you're going to decide. Uh, to use in your recipe. So number one is how many servings is the recipe going to make? If I'm doing it for a home cook, I want to make sure it makes four servings. I don't want to make 40 servings. So then I know I'm going to scale my ingredients to make enough for four servings. And then what I want to do is figure out, you know, what my starting point is. So I am going to make up just a very simple honey mint vinaigrette. And I happen to know for four servings, I don't need a liter of vinegar, but probably for 40 servings, I might. So start with uh, a smaller amount. And one of the things that um, is really easy to get caught up in in recipe development is just measuring and, and mixing together and tasting and, and you think it's all great, but if you didn't write it down, you might not remember. So I actually go old school, pen and paper in the kitchen. Uh, you can sketch it out on the computer first if you want, and, but I, I do like to print it out. Um, it saves the screen from getting messy from, from doing too much kitchen and computer work. But I actually do write it down, um, write the notes, and then as you adjust, as you go through the recipe, keep track of those notes. So be very diligent because again, we want somebody else to follow these instructions. And if you forgot to write something down and you didn't include it, uh, you, they're not gonna get the same result. So choose your language, write it down, and know that how much quantity you're going for at the end. And so that's how much you know to start with. So one of the other things to keep in mind is um, techniques, equipment that your target audience is going to have. So obviously, if you're in a big kitchen, they have giant bowls, they have giant whisks, um, they can make a, you know, a liter of salad dressing with no problem. Um, but at home, people might not have that big equipment. So you have to scale the equipment size down as well as the ingredients and be consistent. So one of the things is you can't write part of the recipe with, you know, making a liter of salad dressing and then the other components only make you know a couple of cups so you don't want a couple of cups of vegetables and a liter of salad dressing to go with it because that's wasteful the people at home won't have another use for it um, whereas if you're doing it big scale you also don't want to only make you know four cups of salad but you know, and, and expect that to serve 40 people. So make sure all of your components in your recipe make this appropriate quantity for the end recipe. Um, when you're choosing your measurements, that's something also very important. So you might have scales and you want to do things by weights, but if you're doing it for people at home, keep in mind not a lot of people have scales and they also don't measure very small amounts um, very accurately. So most home cooks, I'm doing mine for home cooks today, so we're using cups and tablespoons. We might use milliliters, grams, so we might use metric. It's always helpful to include both in your recipe because there are de definitely different schools and some people only use tablespoons and cups and pounds and ounces and other people are much more comfortable in milliliters and grams. So one of the things is, is you need a standard conversion chart and you need to include one consistently, so all tablespoons and all milliliters and don't interchange. So don't call for a tablespoon of this and five milliliters of that and 250 grams of this and four ounces of that because that's confusing to the person following your recipe. So stay consistent with your measurements. And I'm making my honey mint vinaigrette. I'd say I want probably about a half a cup 
um, total. I'm going to use cups and tablespoons and I just find most home cooks understand that but I also will include the equivalent. So I'm going to start with three tablespoons of vinegar. So first I'm going to write it down. Three tablespoons of cider vinegar and put that in my bowl and I actually measure very accurately. That's one of the things about recipe development. You want to make sure that you are really using the amount that you're saying because that's what people are at home are gonna do. They're, they're not gonna know if you said, oh, there's a little extra, I'm just gonna pour it in, or oh, I didn't have quite enough, so I'm just gonna call it three tablespoons. But we're actually gonna be very accurate, measure our three tablespoons and put those in the bowl. So there, I've used my spoon, and I didn't eyeball it, I made sure it was level, and there's my vinegar. So the next thing that we need to do is um, make sure that you're writing it down, like I said, and including every ingredient on the list as you use it. So if I'm now going to put in my um, honey, I'm gonna write the honey down next. So I'm gonna try one teaspoon of honey, and the reason we write things down in order is it's logic in the kitchen. People, if you've got your list and you, you, you sort of put things at random and not the order that you add them to the bowl, people are gonna miss out and they're gonna skip steps and they're gonna skip ingredients. And there's nothing worse than having your ingredients at the end and go, oops, I forgot to put this in. So the ingredients list gives big people the instructions and then the method gives them a checks and balances. So I'm gonna say, you know, combine in a bowl, three tablespoons of vinegar, one teaspoon of honey, and actually measure my one teaspoon of honey. It's obviously kind of messy, so sometimes it takes a little spatula and, you know, some precise measurement. And it really, really doesn't make a really big difference if I have a tiny bit more or a tiny bit less, but if you're baking, it would. And we want to make sure our instructions are actually what we did. So that's one of the keys about measuring. So I'm adding that to the bowl, so I put that on next and whisk it together. So then in my method, I'm gonna say whisk those together. So what you wanna do is dissolve the honey. So if you're writing your instruction, we want to use action words. So just like we want precision in our measuring, we want precision in our method. So use action words, use descriptive words, one of the things that, um, you know, it can be kind of vague if you just say mix. Well, does that mean I mix with a mixer? Does that mean I mix with an immersion blender? Does that mean I mix with a spoon or a whisk? So I'm gonna say, combine these in a bowl and whisk until blended. So now that's giving my recipe reader the exact method that I use. And so then they can get the same results as I did. And then I'm going to measure my oil. So. Oh, I'm gonna put my mint in. So one of the things about measuring, so I've got my chop, my finely chopped mint here. One of the big things about measuring um, produce, for example, so if you uh, want to say, you want to call for a whole, one whole red pepper, and then you want to slice it. So you call one red pepper, comma, sliced. So that means you've taken, oh, I'm gonna have an orange pepper. Take your orange pepper, one orange pepper, comma, slice. So then I take my one orange pepper and I slice it. However, if I only think I need a half cup of sliced pepper, I'm not gonna call for half a cup of pepper sliced because how do you measure half a cup of pepper before it's sliced? It's very difficult. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice up my pepper and then I'm gonna measure half a cup and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call for one half cup sliced orange pepper. So if the modifier, so the sliced, is before the ingredient, that means you cut it before you measure it. If the modifier, the word sliced, is after the ingredient, that means you measure the ingredient whole or half and then you slice it. So that's one of the things that um, stumps people a lot is, is if you can't measure the whole item in a cup, then how, how do you measure that? And you don't get an accurate measure unless you put the modifier first. So all of these instructions have a reason and, um, and the reason is we want it to be easy for people to replicate our recipes. So same as at calling for one zucchini. 
So if I'm having a recipe and it's, you know, um, really crucial how much zucchini is it? Do I call for one zucchini? Is that one giant zucchini, one very large zucchini, or one small zucchini? That's when it might actually be better to call for a weight or a measurement of sliced zucchini, if that's an important part of the recipe. So I'm using my mint. Hmm, do I use one bunch of mint? Is this one bunch of mint? Or is this one bunch of mint? It can vary. So what I'm gonna do is, I certainly don't want a whole bunch because I'm only making a small salad. So I'm going to call for finely chopped mint and I'm gonna use two teaspoons of finely chopped mint to start. So one teaspoon, two teaspoons. And I'm gonna write that down. So two teaspoons chopped mint. And if I decide later it needs more mint, we can add that at the end and then just make sure you write it down. And then I'm gonna take my oil and I'm gonna measure it. And I'm gonna start with about a quarter cup. And now I wanna whisk it in, but we all know we want an emulsified salad dressing. So we're professionals, we know that. So I don't just dump my oil in. What I wanna do is gradually pour the oil while whisking and these are all the instructions you want to incorporate into your method and use the action say gradually pour and rather than just pour because pour might just mean to somebody dump it all in and it, interpretation can be a dangerous thing in, in recipe development so gradually pour while whisking and then we have our orantil so it's not quite as important um, you know with something as simple as a salad dressing but cooking a stew or cooking a sauce our orantil needs to tell us what we're looking for at the end. Now I'm gonna say whisk until blended. So if I was cooking a sauce, I would say cook, and then I would tell them it's stirring while I'm cooking it. I've got my sauce simmering, so I want it simmering. I don't want it boiling, I don't want it just cooking. So I'm gonna say simmer sauce, stirring often for about 15 minutes. So tell them how long it's gonna take approximately, but then give them a visual clue and a textural clue. And that visual clue and textural clue will know, tell them what's done. So we wanna say until sauce is very thick and mounds on a spoon. So the more descriptive you are, the better off your instructions are that somebody else is going to be able to replicate them. One of the things about recipe development is you wanna anticipate the questions before the reader has a chance to have them. So you answer those questions in your writing beforehand, and then they don't have to sit there going, uh, oh, I wonder if they meant to stir. I wonder if they meant to whisk. Should I make this ahead? For my salad dressing, I can now say, you can put this in the fridge for up to four hours, but you know, cover and refrigerate for up to four hours before serving. So we want to answer those questions before your reader has to even think of them. Then the other thing is, Think about coaching somebody. So imagine that you're in the kitchen with them, but you can't touch anything. You have your hands behind your back and you have to use all of your words to coach them how to replicate the recipe. So that's a really good practice. Even do it with somebody in your kitchen when you're developing a recipe for the first time and you have to tell them the instructions. And so those are the instructions you need to write down in your method. So we've listed our ingredients, we've listed them in order um, that we've used them. We've made sure all our ingredients that are called for in the ingredients list are in the method. And we make sure all the ingredients that are in the method are also in the ingredients list. There's nothing worse than getting to step four of a recipe and then it calls for three cups of lobster bisque. Well, I don't have three cups of lobster bisque just hanging out in my fridge, so I need a recipe for the lobster bisque and I need to know that I need to make it ahead, probably the day ahead, rather than just before I'm about to serve my food. So make sure any components, you include the recipe, you include the instructions, and those are in the ingredient list and they're in the method in the order that you're going to use them. So I've made my very simple salad dressing. I'm gonna to top my salad, I've got some sliced cucumbers, so I'm gonna say half a cup of sliced cucumbers. So here's my example of where my cucumber is already sliced and I can measure half a cup. So there's my half a cup of sliced cucumber. Now when it comes to garnishes, you might not need to say exactly three teaspoons of seeds and cranberries. So for things like garnishes where it's not essential the amount, you can add um, sort of just 
list that at the bottom and then say garnish with seeds and cranberries to taste. However, if it's a large component and you really want, you know, one cup of microgreens per serving, you should really call for four cups of microgreens because people might not have that much on hand. But if it's a small amount, you can leave the actual quantity out. So remember to coach people and remember to answer those questions before people have them. Write everything down, write your method down. And then once you've done your recipe, you're happy with the taste, I'm gonna have a little taste. I'm gonna have a little taste, see if I like it. Oh, I forgot to season with salt and pepper. Did I write that down? No, but I would always season with salt and pepper. So I'm gonna season with salt and pepper. This is one that you can do to taste, but if you're using a recipe and you're, you're making it for students and they might not know, a quantity would really be helpful because they might not know how to do to taste. So again, know your audience. Write everything down that you put in there. Don't forget to season and write your salt and pepper on your list. So once you've got your recipe, you're happy with it, you've written everything out, you've checked that you've got all the instructions in there, proofread and proofread again, and maybe even have somebody else proofread and uh, make sure they understand the recipe and ask them if they have any questions because sometimes you might not think of it. And when I'm doing recipe editing and I'll say, you know, when you, when you, you know, cooked the stew, did you, or the soup, did you cool it down before you pureed it? Oh yes, you always cool it down before you puree it. So we need to say that in the recipe. So don't assume they know anything um, and, and include that. So when you're proofreading and when somebody else is proofreading, answer those questions in advance. And once you've done that and you're going to take your photo, make sure your photo matches what you've written in your recipe. Don't decide to add, um, you know, I've decided I'm gonna add some whole cherry tomatoes to my salad, but I didn't call for the whole cherry tomatoes. They're not written in my recipe, but I've added them for the photo because they look pretty. Make sure your recipe and your photo match exactly because that will save the readers some frustration because there's not everybody's cooked one of those recipes. They say it doesn't look like the photo. So keep in mind, answer all of those questions. Do your research first. Know your audience. Keep your ingredients consistent and keep your equipment and your ingredients things that your audience can access. So there's no point in finding some very obscure herb that nobody else is gonna be able to get, but you can get at one tiny little store if that's a recipe designed for all Canadians to cook. So that's again, something very frustrating. And if you also, you're developing a recipe and the component, you know, there's five different components and they all use a large pot. Well, I don't know anybody else that has five large pots in their home. So if it's a home size recipe and you're calling for five large pots to use be at the same time, it's not a very useful recipe. So keep things like that in mind and remember your audience when you're writing your recipe and uh, answer those questions they might have so that uh, it's just like you're in the kitchen with them, coaching them along and using your words to coach them and uh, they can make that recipe exactly like you did and they're gonna love it. Next, we're gonna have our photography with Cindy Beckadam and uh, she's gonna give us some tips to make our wonderful food look just as wonderful in the photo. Hi, Cindy. Thank you so much for joining us for our workshop today. Cindy Beckadam is a food photographer and has lots of knowledge about how to make us uh, not necessarily become photographers in the next uh, few minutes, but how to capture that beautiful plate that you've just assembled and actually how to get it to translate into a photo that looks as delicious and uh, enticing as your plate itself does. Because sometimes I find, Cindy, my food looks great. I take my picture and then I'm like, oh, but it looked so much better in person. So I'm hoping you have some tips to help us with that. Absolutely. So thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. And sort of like you said, we're here to learn how to make our, fo our, our food photos Instagram worthy, right? Right. Um, yes. So I see there you've got a really lovely salad. It's nice and dialed, which is really important. Looks like you've got some nice props around you. Um, so why don't you show me how you would normally take a photo in your kitchen? 
and we can use that as a starting point to sort of figure out what we can do to improve our photos. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to put like a tiny bit of dressing on. I don't want it to be drowned, but I do want it to glisten and um, make sure it looks fresh. So I've added some, you know, cucumber. I'm going to sprinkle a few seeds on top just at the very last minute for garnish. And uh, my lettuce is nice and fresh. I didn't let it sit very long. So I think it's ready for its photo now. Perfect. So the first key is always using really fresh ingredients, which it seems you have no issue with whatsoever. Um, so what's amazing is we really don't need very many fancy tools to take great food photos. We don't need a fancy camera. The um, camera on your phone is going to be more than enough to take a great photo. So why don't okay. you start by taking one right here as it is. Okay. Uh, so angle, like what? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so why don't we try taking one overhead and just a simple bird bird eye view there, um, and okay. we'll look at some different different uh, angles later. Okay, so I don't want it too close, right? Because that kind of can look weird. But I like I, I sort of like the look of the the ingredients, so you can see the components of my of my recipe okay. here. So I'm mm -hmm. going to take a photo. Great way to add interest. Oh. There. Okay. So, so here's. Oh. <laughs> I have some issues. <laughs> okay, what's the issue? So there's uh, my arm, there's a big shadow right across the plate, and it looks a little blue, oddly blue. There, I, I didn't, there's no blue in my plate, but it looks quite blue. Yeah, so it sounds like it's your source of lighting that's the issue. And I would say the number one thing that you need to focus on when you're taking great food photos is making sure that you have good light. Um, oh. And what I can see is that you have a lot of mixed lighting going on. So you have light coming from the window, you have yep. light coming from your stove, it looks yep. like overhead light and what that does is it creates a lot of different colors sort of beaming down on your plate and a lot of different shadows as well so in order to eliminate that the first thing we want to do is we want to turn off all of the lights in the house that are in close proximity so um, even if it's coming from a different room and there's yellow light coming in we want to turn all of that off so okay so and there's another light over there okay huh You've got one behind you too, Jennifer. You don't want to forget oh, that one. And that one, see, that one's always on. So, okay. And really, we want it just, now it feels kind of dark in here. I know. So it may feel kind of dark, but what you've got is nice, beautiful, natural light that's coming from the window that's going to translate really well to the eye. And your image is going to look a lot less flat than it did the first time around. Oh, so okay. Yeah, and no weird shadows and no blue plate. That's amazing. Pretty amazing. So that's the simplest tip right there. Um, but what else you can do, Jennifer, if you're finding it a little dark, is we can actually bounce some light into your photo. Okay, and yeah, it's a little dark on this side. Yeah, so in order to reduce or eliminate that shadow, we can actually use a reflector. Um, oh. So you can use any piece of white cardboard, which you've got right there, or a whiteboard, um, foam car core from the dollar store, no problem. So what I would do is I would angle it in the opposite direction of your window light. Okay, so my window's over here, so I want it opposite like that. You've got it. And okay. what you can do is you can play with the distance uh, from the plate in order to decide how much light you want in your photo. So if you want oh. a really, really bright photo, you would bring um, your piece of cardboard closer. But if okay. you want a little bit of shadow, you could pull it further. So that's up to personal preference and style, but it's definitely something to play with. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna angle it kind of like this because my light's coming in here. And now I'm gonna try Oops, took a photo of the cutting board. Um, oh, but I, I want to make sure the whiteboard doesn't show, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that brightened up that side perfectly, but no shadows. 
Wonderful. Um, so another tip, Jennifer, is that you know if you had really bright light coming through your window, um, let's say in the morning, the, the sunshine is changing all the time, um, that can create a really dif different effect on what your, your photo looks like can create really harsh lines and that's not, not something that we always want. Usually we like really soft photos. So right. your photo looks great here today, but I'm gonna share with you guys a setup that I use at home using what I call a scrim. So if you can see in this photo here, you can see I've got um, a sort of naked reflector um, in the window. So it's a very sort of thin um, piece of, or, piece of cloth, you could use a, a white sheet in your window as well, would work really, really nicely. And what that does is it just softens the light that's coming in and that's lighting up uh, your plate or your whatever you're photographing. It works really well and it doesn't have to be an expensive setup. So it's not like a harsh spotlight coming in from one side. So yeah, yeah. because you know, inevitably the sun comes out as, as you're trying to, and then it, and it changes your plan. <laughs> sure. If you have an overcast day though, a lot of times we don't have to worry about that so much. Right, but you don't always get to plan that when, uh, when you're taking your food photo, do you? That's now, true. what if, I mean, at night or you know, later in the afternoon, it gets pretty dark in here. Um, I tend to like to go outside. So do you have any tips for like full on natural light outside? Because again, you get these long shadows depending on what time of day it is. If it's at noon, it's like super bright and my plate just kind of like blows out. So just like you said initially, the best time to be photographing outside is probably gonna be early morning or in the evening because you're gonna get a lot softer light and it's gonna be a little bit more directional, kind of like your window light. Um, so that would be my first tip. Make sure you're photographing when the light is softer. Um, but if you can't do that, and let's say you do wanna take a photo at noon, um, they're all, or, there are always places where you could find some shade. So that might be underneath a tree, underneath a porch. Um, you know, the natural light will still be coming in, but looking for some shade is gonna be really important. Otherwise, you're gonna get really, really bright, harsh light, and you're not gonna like the look of your photo. Right, okay. Now we did overhead pictures, but have you got any tips? So, because sometimes, sometimes I like to see a photo that maybe it looks like I'm just about to sit down and eat it from sort of a different angle. Have you got some tips about angles? Absolutely. So there's so many different ways you can take a food photo. There's no wrong way, but kind of knowing what works for your own personal style and kind of changing it up can be a really exciting way to add some interest. Um, so I'll share with you a few photos here. Um, the first option is you can take a really symmetrical photo. Um, you can anchor your plate into the photo. So that means that you would sort of cut off part of the, the plate, for example, and anchor it into the corner. Um, you, know, you could use negative space, which is when you would pull further back and leave some empty space around um, the bowl or the plate or whatever it is you're photographing again. Um, you can use props to do what we call framing. So you could frame your image. Like uh, a fork maybe? Sure, you can use a fork. The only thing that you'll wanna be mindful of when you're using any kind of cutlery or glass is that if it's really shiny, you might actually see your, your reflection in it. Oh yeah, you know what? I have a shiny fork and I can see the pink of my phone in it. So that yeah. doesn't really match. <laughs> so that doesn't always work, but if you do have access to mat matted cutlery, that will work really well. Um, might be also important to consider, you know, when you're photographing on, uh, let's say a stainless steel surface, it will kind of have a similar effect where it might be really reflective. So that's where using a piece of wood or a cutting board or even a piece of Bristol board from the dollar store to photograph on or a tablecloth can eliminate that. Um, so just be really mindful of those reflecting reflective surfaces. Um, right, yeah. 
and because and, and you don't want anything with like that's really shiny that's going to show you in it because um you know then i think that's so distracting sometimes you catch that in a photo and you're like all i can see is that person when you're supposed to be looking at the food right exactly so it can definitely create some distraction but because you did mention us being in the photo you can also add what we call human touch so that might be either using your hand or asking someone to maybe be spooning or forking something out of the photo um, or even someone holding a bowl or an ice cream cone can add a really interesting element of interest. Oh, or even the pour. The dressing yeah. pour. Absolutely. The dressing pour. Let me try that. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll uh, graduate to that after the fact. <laughs> Sometimes we need some help with that. It's a lot easier if you have a second person. Um, mm -hmm. But the last tip I thought I'd share in that realm is if you have access to using portrait mode um, on your phone, which we normally use to make the background blurry when we're taking a portrait of someone, you can also okay. do that with your food. Um, so maybe you're holding a bowl outside and you know the grass is green and nice and soft in the background. Those are some great tips, Cindy. Thank you so much because you know, my inclination was always to make it bright. And now I know that that was actually fighting with my uh, my photo success. And uh, I can do some pretty nifty phone uh, things just with my phone camera and uh, make that food pop and make sure everybody is salivating over our food photos. Absolutely. That's what we want. And we need a lot less than we might imagine that we need. Um, we really just need to pay attention to our light, practice our composition and make sure our food looks really fresh and, you know, just use your smartphone. It doesn't take more than that. Right. And one of the other tips is maybe if you get some good photos and you go, oh, yeah, I like that one just know what settings you used if you're changing up the settings and just like a recipe development and uh, you take notes take notes for your photos too and then you're ahead of the game next time exactly because we can always improve with a little practice but keeping track of of what works and what doesn't is really important perfect well thank you so much for your time and thanks for those tips and uh, i'm gonna keep practicing my pleasure hope you have fun Thank you so much to Jennifer and Cindy for sharing all of your expertise. I think your tips and tricks are really gonna help the students once they get started in the kitchen. And of course, thank you so much to Canola Eat Well for making this event possible and to Lynn for all of your support. We're so grateful for all you do for Cooks the Books. And again, to the students, good luck. We're looking forward to your submissions and feel free to reach out to me with any questions and uh, if there's anything I can do to help. So, uh, happy cooking.